Yeah. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker pop wheat yeah. and Quaker pop rice, yeah. the breakfast cereal shot from gun, yeah. Yeah. present Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you husky! <laughs> gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. There's no one that can make a better cereal than Quaker Pop Rice. It's nice. And when you hear that shooting, you're darn tootin' that Quaker makes the ones shot from guns. And remember that if you want a super breakfast tomorrow morning, pour out a heaping bowl full of delicious, crisp, nourishing Quaker Pop Rice or Quaker Popped Wheat. Cover it with milk or thick, rich yellow cream. Top it with sliced bananas or chilled fruit. Take a big spoonful. And mmm, mmm, there's a super treat that can't be beat. So get ready. Get super delicious, nourishing Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice for breakfast tomorrow. With the completion of the railroad from Skagway to Whitehorse and the stage road from Whitehorse to Dawson, this was the route by which most of the gold was shipped out of the Klondike. Not one ounce was lost for nearly six months. And then, one summer afternoon, the stage rattled down the main street of Whitehorse. Get up there! Come on! The guard was slumped in the seat beside Frank Allen, the driver, and Frank drove past his station onto the headquarters of the Northwest Mounted Police. Oh! Oh! Uh Inspector Conrad was standing in front of his office, and Frank jumped to the ground and ran toward him. Inspector, I want to report a holdup. A holdup and a murder. Joe's been shot. He's dead. There were three men with bandanas over their faces. Rode out from the trees. Joe went for his gun, and they plugged him. They took the gold. There was nothing I could do but give it to them. I couldn't. Now take it easy, Frank. Uh, Let's get the facts. Where did it happen? About five miles from here, in the woods this side of Jenkins Landing. There were three men. Yes, sir. Can you describe them? I know who one of them was. Who? Uh, Mike Brady. Are you sure? Yes, sir. You see, we stopped a while at the landing, and while we were there, Mike rode past. He was riding a paint, the one he bought last spring. Fifteen minutes later, when he and the other crooks held us up, he was riding another horse. But I saw the paint tethered back among the trees. It was Mike who shot Joe, all right. Uh, you ready to swear to that? Absolutely. How much gold did they get? It's right here on the manifest. There. Fifteen hundred ounces. Well, they'll find it hard to spend this gold or get it out of the country. Well, why? Shipping from the Apex Mining Company. That's on Rainbow Creek, and Rainbow Creek gold is the finest in the Klondike. I'd recognize it on sight. So would anyone who's been up here for any length of time. Rainbow Creek gold? Apex Mining Company. It's here in black and white. I'll circulate word about this all through the territory. Northwest Mounted will investigate anyone who starts spending quality gold. But you don't have to do that. All you have to do is find Mike Brady and arrest him. Constable Downey? Yes, sir. Get out of the scene of the holdup. See if you can pick up a trail. On my way, sir. Let's have some help with the body man. All right. We'll take it into headquarters. I got him right Though Constable Downey was able to pick up the holdup men's trail, he lost it in the rough country west of the river and reported back to headquarters. The inspector assigned every available man to the search for Mike Brady and sent a full account of the holdup to every northwest mounted post in the territory. In addition, the Apex Mining Company offered a $5,000 reward for the return of the gold. But for two weeks, there were no results. Then Sergeant Preston rode into Whitehorse and reported to the inspector. Oh, Blackie. Oh, boy. <laughs> Inside, King. Sergeant. Hello, Inspector. Hello, King. 
What brings you here, Sergeant? It was Major Warren's idea. He thought I might be able to help on your holdup case. Perhaps I'm too late. No, you're not, Sergeant. Come into my office. Sit down, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. We haven't found any trace of Mike Brady. I know him, Inspector. You mean well? I thought so until now. I never thought he'd turn crook. Hard to believe for any of his friends. But he's had bad luck this year. If he were innocent, Sergeant, why hasn't he given himself up? Well, sir, if Mike were accused of something he didn't do, it would make him mad. And he'd want to do something about it himself rather than leave it to the law. Frank Allen's identification was positive, Sergeant. I hear that Allen's given up his job driving the stage. Well, he says he's lost his nerve. Have you been keeping an eye on him, sir? No reason to suspect him of being involved in the robbery. Still... Still, we're not ignoring the possibility. He's being watched. He's living at the Palace Hotel, and he hasn't left town since the robbery. Have you questioned all Mike's close friends? They have no idea where he is. He was planning to marry Rose Jenkins. I know, Sergeant. He had dinner with Rose and her father at the landing on the day the stage was held up. They say they haven't seen him since, which may or may not be true. They refuse to believe Mike is guilty. Frank Allen testified that he saw Mike ride past the landing while the stage was stopped there. Did Rose and her father see him at the same time? Yes, Sergeant. He waved to all three of them. Ah, a reckless thing for a man to do who was planning a robbery. Almost foolhardy. Well, the reward the company's offering should lead to something sooner or later... Everyone in the district should be on the lookout for fine gold and on the lookout for Mike, too. Listen. Shots. This isn't Dawson. That means trouble. Come on. There were nearly 20 men gathered in the street halfway down the block from headquarters. And all of them were looking toward the livery stable. Who fired those shots? Uh, I did, Inspector. Frank Allen. It's Mike Brady. He went into the stable. I called to him to stop, but he wouldn't, so I, I fired over his head. Looks to me as if one of your bullets nicked the stable door. Well, Mike's wanted for murder, isn't he? And he's armed. You'll have to use your gun if you want to capture him. I don't think so. With your permission, Inspector? Go ahead, Sergeant. The sergeant walked straight toward the door of the livery stable. While the men who were watching, with the exception of the inspector and Frank Allen, scattered for cover. Mike, it's Preston. I'm coming in. Good afternoon, Sergeant. You aren't Mike Brady. I never said I was. Will you come here, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. And you, Frank Allen. Yes, sir. This way. White Horse isn't very hospitable, stranger. You look a great deal like a man who's wanted by the law. Why... This isn't Mike. No, but you're Frank Allen, the man who identified Mike as taking part in the holdup, who identified Mike as the one who killed the guard. Yeah. You look a lot like Mike. I happen to be his brother, John. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing in Skagway, and I came up here as soon as I heard Mike had been accused of murder. If Mike should ever come to trial, Allen, your shooting at me will be part of his defense. Huh? You mistook me for Mike. You may have mistaken someone else for Mike on the day of the holdup. Hey, you're enough like him to be his twin. Hardly. He's at least three inches taller than I am and 20 pounds heavier. He doesn't wear a mustache and his hair is much lighter. Oh, well, now I can see... And that... the jury will be able to see that your eyes aren't to be trusted. You've uh, come up here to help Mike? Yes, Sergeant. Best way you can do that is by persuading him to give himself up. I intend to do just that. Where do you plan to start looking for him? Came here to hire a horse. Planned a ride to Jenkins Landing. I'd like a talk with Rose and her father myself. Do you mind if I come along? I'd rather you didn't. I'll have much more success if I go alone. Oh, you may be right. You have no objections, do you, Inspector? None at all, Sergeant. I'm relieving Allen of his gun, Mr. Brady. If he should make any further mistakes, there'll not be any serious consequences. Hand it over, Frank. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. I'll be about my business. Half an hour later, John Brady rode out of town in the direction of Jenkins Landing. Shortly after dusk, his horse returned to the stable, riderless. Constable Downey brought the news to headquarters. Oh, Inspector, Sergeant Preston. What's the matter, Jim? The horse John Brady hired has come back to the stable, badly frightened with an empty saddle. Huh? Sergeant, you'd better head for Jenkins Landing fast. Yes, sir. Downey, you go with him. I'm set to ride, sir. Let's go. Come on, King. <laughs> There was a bright moon that night, and the sergeant and Downey held their mounts in, searching the trail for any sign of violence. You've been assigned to this case from the beginning, haven't you, Jim? I'm the one who tried to follow the outlaw's trail right after the holdup, sergeant. I wish you'd been here with King at the time. They headed west? Into the hills. Rough country. Wilkes and Barrett are still patrolling it. You've been working in town since the robbery? That's right. Watching Frank Allen? Yes, but 
That didn't take much doing. He's hardly left the palace bar, telling his story to anybody who'd buy him a drink. I don't trust that man. No, neither do I. Does he have any particular friends? Well, he used to hang around with Luke Random and Bill Garrity and Doc Walsh. But I haven't seen much of them lately. Seen anything of them? Oh, sure, they're prospectors, in and out of town. They were in town this afternoon. Alan said there were three men who held up the stage. We might suspect any three men, Sergeant. Sure enough. <laughs> oh, King's found something. Ho, Luggy, ho, ho, ho. Stain on the grass here. Look at my fingers. Red. King's heading toward the river. Something in that clump of bushes he doesn't like. Stand aside, boy. John Brady. Shot through the head. Could somebody have mistaken him for Mike again? Perhaps. Perhaps not. We can only be sure that this is murder. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Say, does your whole family start out every morning with a nourishing breakfast? Well, be sure to include heaping bowlfuls of delicious Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice topped with fruit and milk or cream. Remember, the one shot from guns furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. So tomorrow and every morning, let the whole family pour out big bowls of the nourishing cereal treat they like to eat. Delicious Quaker popped rice or Quaker popped wheat. And listen, fellas and girls, don't miss out on the exciting surprise at the end of the program. Have paper and pencil ready for sure. Now to continue. John Brady's body was discovered less than half a mile from Jenkins Landing, and it was taken there by the sergeant and constable Downey. When Bart Jenkins opened the door of his cabin and saw their limp burden, his eyes widened in alarm. Hey, someone hurt, Sergeant? He's dead, Bart. See, it's Mike. No, it's his brother, John. Put a blanket on the couch. Uh, sure, right here. <laughs> now another to cover him, please. Thanks. John Brady dead, right? It's terrible. He meant to persuade Mike to give himself up. He's on his way here to have a talk with you and Rose. Well, I couldn't have helped him with... Rose? Where is she? I don't know. She may have gone to him. To Mike? I think she knows where he is. All I can tell you is that I was down at the river sawing logs until long after dark. When I came up for supper, she was gone. There was only the window. The window? Yes, that one. Broken. And I found this stone on the floor underneath it. I, I don't know what it means... Or if it means anything. There might have been a note wrapped around the stone. Yes, it might have been. I thought of that. Rose took the gray mare. We'll follow her, Jim. But how can you? I have no idea where she's gone. The ground's soft. There'll be fresh hoof prints. King will be able to pick up the trail. Then go, please, find her. I warned her that if she knew anything about Mike, she should tell the police. That it was wrong and dangerous not to confide in you, but she refused to admit anything. Why did you even suspect she knew where Mike was? Oh, this isn't the first time she slipped away. Oh? Twice in the dead of night she's done it. And I've awakened when she came back. But I couldn't get a word out of her. She'd just gone for a ride, she said. Hmm. Now let's go, Jim. We have a job for you, King. <laughs> the trail King followed led into the hills, through Gornaway Gulch, along Piney Ridge, and down a long slope into Big Bear Valley. As they reached the edge of the valley, the sergeant and the constable saw a girl heading straight for them. She was riding a gray horse. There was no doubt it was Rose Jenkins. But she swerved aside, urging her mount toward the forest that rimmed the valley on the north. Come on, Lucky. Hit it. Hit it. The sergeant and the constable called on their horses for more speed and cut off the girl's escape. The sergeant reached for the bridle of the gray and pulled the mare to a halt. Hold, Lucky. Hold, 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 hold. You're a policeman. This is Constable Downey. I'm Sergeant Preston. We've met before, Rose. I remember, Sergeant. You're a friend of Mike. I'd like to prove that, Rose. How? By arresting him? By persuading him to give himself up. You'd try him for a crime he didn't commit. And Frank Allen's testimony would send him to jail at the gallows. He might be proved innocent. He's going to do that himself. He'll need help. 
You must tell us where he is. I promised I wouldn't, and I don't break promises. John Brady's been murdered, Rose. <gasps> no. On the trail to Jenkins Landing, and the same men who killed him may be trying to kill Mike. It could have been a trick. What could have been a trick? I told you the truth about John, and I'm telling you the truth about Mike. He saved my life once, and I want to return the favor. Well, that isn't what I meant. I believe you. The note could have been a trick. What note? It was wrapped around a rock and thrown through the front window of her cabin. It was a little after dark. I was out in the kitchen. I heard the glass break. And then I heard someone riding away. Whoever it was had disappeared in the forest by the time I reached the front of the house. I found the note on the floor. What did it say? Well, there it is, Sergeant. The men you're looking for are hiding in Crystal Canyon. They have the gold with them. A friend. A trick? Of course this is a trick. It's nothing but bait to set a trap. What have you done, Rose? Showed this note to Mike? Yes. He's on his way to Crystal Canyon now. You get back to the landing, Jim. We have no time to lose. Get up, Blackie! Come, Come on, Kate! Come on! The wind blew cold through Crystal Canyon. Luke Random and Bill Garrity huddled close to their campfire. But they leaped to their feet as they heard hoofbeats on the rocky floor of the canyon. Whoa there, Ho! Ho! It's all right, it's dark. What's the matter, Doc? Cold feet? Get back to the opening of the canyon and stand guard. I don't have to anymore. He's coming. Hmm? You sure? I saw him clearly on the lower trail. He's riding the paint. All right. Get behind those rocks over there. You'll be able to keep him covered from the time he rounds a bend in the canyon. But hold your fire. I want a chance to talk with him before we finish him off. Make sure he hasn't been in contact with the police. Uh, Bill? Yeah. You and I will roll up in our blankets here by the campfire and pretend we're asleep. And I'm moving behind him and stick a gun in his ribs. That's the idea. Now get going. Keep Except for the sighing of the wind, there was no sound in the canyon for the next 15 minutes. The campfire began to burn itself out, and Bill called softly to Luke. Shall I put some more wood on the fire? No. We want him to see us, don't we? There's a moon. He'll see us. Listen. That's a wolf up on the rim of the canyon. I see him. Looks more like a dog to me. What of it? Shut up. The minutes stretched out. When 15 more had passed, Bill called to Luke again. Hey, I see him. Quiet. He's over by the horses opening your saddlebags. Now he's hefting one of the sacks. He's sure we have the gold now. Much good it'll do him. But he's coming this way. Okay, quiet. Footsteps sounded closer and closer to the dying campfire. At last, a tall man wearing a soft hat and a white deerskin jacket stood beside it. A bandana covered his face. He held a gun in his hand. Roll out of those blankets. <laughs> Luke, wake up. Hmm? Some armor has got the drop on us. What's that, Bill? Luke Random and Bill Garrity, I presume. No, it's Mike Brady. <laughs> what makes you think so? There's no sense in covering your face with a bandana. I know that jacket. So you two held up the stage and killed the guard. It's you the law's looking for, Mike. It's you who have the gold. Too bad Rainbow Creek gold is too easily recognized to spend. We intend to make some money on it. How? By turning it over to the law and collecting the reward the company has offered for its return. You intend to give yourselves up at the same time? Why, no. We're not going to admit we stole the gold. You've admitted it to me. I don't remember saying anything like that. We just found the gold in this canyon where you stashed it, Mike. You know I had nothing to do with that robbery. Our friend Frank Allen says you did. Would you like to hear the whole story we mean to tell the police? Yes. I'll talk much more comfortably if you drop your gun. That'll be a little foolish, don't you think? Foolish, perhaps. But you have no choice. Doc Walsh is directly behind you now, and he's ready to stick his gun in your back. Yeah. Drop the gun, Mike, or I pull this trigger. Ah. I see I have no choice. Up with your hands. Reach high. High enough? It'll do. You promised to tell me the whole story, Luke. Why not? We have nothing to lose now. It was you three who held up the stage. That's right. And Frank Allen was in on the deal. Also right. And he's earned his share of the reward. Identifying you as one of the road agents was an inspiration. <laughs> You've cooperated, too, Mike. Too bad you can't share in the reward. How have I cooperated? By acting like a guilty man. I'll not sound like one when I accuse you three of robbery and murder. Ah, but you'll have no chance to do that. 
As I said before, our story to the police will be that we found the gold in this canyon. We made camp here. And during the night, you showed up, Mike. There was a fight and you were killed. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> Tomorrow morning, we take the gold in your body to Whitehorse, collect the company's reward, and say goodbye to the Yukon. Why did you kill John? How did he know about that? Ah, the girl must have told him when she delivered the note tonight. But how could she have known about it? They must have found the body. I told her we should have waited it and dropped it in the river. Nah, you were in too much of a hurry. There's nothing to connect us with the murder. Why did you kill John? He was going to persuade you to give yourself up. And we didn't want that to happen. So now you've reached the end of the story. Except for one detail. Well, you've covered everything, I think. So there's no longer any need for this disguise. Hey, what are you doing? Taking off this bandana. <laughs> It isn't Mike. What? Sergeant Preston. Oh. Doc had stepped around in front of the sergeant to see his face. Surprise and indecision had made him drop his gun hand for a fraction of a second. And the sergeant took advantage of it. His rights and lefts connected solidly with Doc's jaw. And Doc dropped to the ground. The gun knocked from his grasp as he landed. But he started crawling toward it. And his fingers were on the butt when the sergeant landed on top of him. Desperately, they struggled for possession of the weapon. At the same time, Luke and Bill dove for their guns. Shoot him! Constable Downey broke from his cover toward the entrance of the canyon and opened fire on them. One of his shots caught Bill in the shoulder and put him out of the fight. Luke ducked behind a rock. He was about to return the constable's fire when a living projectile hit him from the rear. King had entered the battle, and he pinned Luke to the ground until the constable reached his side and disarmed the road agent. All right, King, I have his gun. On your feet, Luke. There was no chance for the constable to interfere in the fight between the sergeant and Doc as they rolled over and over, still struggling for the possession of the revolver. King howled in frustration. Then for a moment, the sergeant had Doc's shoulders pinned to the ground, and the dog saw his chance. His jaws closed on the gun, and he wrenched it from Doc's hand. Good work, boy. Now you may get up, Doc. I should have drilled you the first minute. If Luke hadn't wanted to brag... Ah, if your eyes were any good, this wouldn't have happened. You told us it was Mike who was riding up the trail. It was. Well, look, Sergeant Preston's wearing Mike's clothes. Doc made no mistake, Luke. He did see Mike on the lower trail. We didn't overtake him until he'd reached the entrance to the canyon. You changed clothes with him there. Exactly. To let you think your plan was succeeding. To encourage your conversation. You wouldn't have bragged to a police officer, Luke. No, if I'd come in here wearing a uniform, your story would have been that you found this gold. And it would have been very difficult to prove otherwise. Why? Now, however, we have a complete confession. We'll bandage Garrity's shoulder, put handcuffs on you two, and get started for Whitehorse. When we get there, we'll arrest Frank Allen, and all four of you will be locked up. What about the gold, Sergeant? Mike's waiting for us just outside the canyon, Constable. The gold will travel in his saddlebags, and that means he'll collect the company reward. When Luke, Doc, Garrity, and Allen are tried and convicted for robbery and murder, this case will be closed. We'll return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. But first... Here is Sergeant Preston. Boys and girls, listen to every single word of this last-minute message from our old friend Gabby Hayes, who is right now surrounded by a crowd of his young friends. Boy, oh boy, is it fun to wear a Gabby Hayes prospector's hat. Well, I'm glad I got one, too. Gee, now everybody's wearing a hat like Gabby. Huh. Look like there's about eight million Gabby Hayes around here. I guess it's a good thing I decided to have some hats like mine made special for my friends because they're sure going like hotcakes. The idea of wearing a hat like old Gabby's is sweeping the country. It's the darndest hat you ever seen. There never was one like it afore, and maybe never will be again. I bet a million people have asked me where I got that hat of mine. So, buckaroos, don't miss this chance to get a hat that's the special spitting image of mine. It's like the one I wear in my Western movies and on my televisionary programs. Now, this is the last time, the very last time I can tell you about it. So don't miss out. Don't be the only buckaroo without a hat like old Gabby. This is it, fellas and girls. The last time of all times on this program, you'll be offered a real Gabby Hayes prospector's hat. And everybody's wearing them. 
Nobody wants to miss out on this chance of a lifetime to get a hat just like old Gabby's. Why, there isn't any other hat in the whole world like Gabby Hayes Prospector's hat. It has that same wonderful beat-up look to the brim. That same rakish angle straight up in your forehead. A cord under your chin with a hitch to hold it tight. And listen, this Gabby Hayes Prospector's hat isn't paper or flimsy stuff. It's made of real good quality soft wool felt. Not part wool, but 100% wool felt. Why, you might think this hat would cost two or three dollars. But it's yours, if you hurry, for only 75 cents in coin and one box top from a package of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. If you don't agree this hat is worth every penny you paid, return it and we will gladly refund your money plus postage. Imagine a real hat of soft 100% wool felt for only 75 cents in coin. Think of what a wonderful present this hat will be for you and for your special friends. It comes in three sizes to fit every boy and girl. Now, I'll bet you don't know your head size. Well, just for fun, first take a guess. And then see how close you are. All you do is put a tape measure or strip of paper around your head at the forehead. Hurry and do it now. There's no time to lose. Then jot down the exact number of inches, even to an eighth of an inch, and send this measurement with your order. Gabby will send you the size closest to your measurement. Remember, send your name and address with 75 cents in coin and one box top from a package of swell-tasting Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice. Send to Hat, Box L, Chicago 77, Illinois. This is absolutely the last day, the very last mention of this radio offer. Don't be left out. Send now tonight. And Gabby will send you a Gabby Hayes Prospector's hat just like his. Now get this address. It's the last time. Send to hat, H-A-T, hat, box L, Chicago 77, Illinois. And don't forget your measurements. And now, here is Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston reporting for duty, Inspector. Sergeant, two crooks robbed the bank in Selkirk. They took $10,000. Any instructions, sir? Well, the weather is unusual bad, and I think a blizzard is brewing. Those men must be brought in. Very well, sir. I'll pick up their trail and bring them in. I'll leave at once. In spite of the bad weather, Preston thought of the case as a routine one. But he had no way of knowing that before it was completed... His great dog, Yukon King, would stand alone between him and death. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon is brought to you every Tuesday and Thursday at this same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Only Quaker Paco 10 has wheat and rice shot from gun. That's Quaker Paco 10, a regular cereal pantry. Six different delicious ready-to-serve cereals. Ten crisp, fresh individual servings. At breakfast, you can take your pick of the pack. Have your own separate individual package. Enjoy a different cereal, extra fresh every morning. Just remember, only Quaker Paco 10 has all your family's cereal favorites. Try Quaker Paco 10. You'll be glad you did. Listen tomorrow at this same time to The Green Hornet, brought to you by the drink that makes you feel fresh again, delicious Orange Crush. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.